An ancient Roman historian described Egypt as the gift of the Nile. Today, a nation of 30 million people still depends on the river for its existence. It brings a narrow ribbon of life to what would otherwise be total desolation. Five thousand years ago, this long, fertile valley gave birth to one of the world's most advanced civilizations. Here, the earth yielded enough for man to stop struggling for mere existence and start reaching for the stars. To the ancient Egyptians, life seemed so rich and good that they tried to carry it with them beyond the grave. Here in the Valley of the Kings in 1922, the English archaeologist Howard Carter discovered a tomb which had remained untouched for 3,300 years, the tomb of the 19-year-old king Tutankhamun. His mummified body lay inside four coffins of cedar of Lebanon, entirely covered with gold. In the whole history of excavation, wrote Carter, nothing so wondrous had been seen as was now revealed by an electric torch. The golden throne depicting the young king and his queen is now in the Cairo Museum, along with the clay models of his subjects, destined to spring to life again and serve him in the next world as they had in this. The gold mask that covered his dead face stares out on an Egypt that has known many rulers since his reign. But some things have remained obstinately unchanged. The peasants who created the pharaoh's wealth are still the foundation of the Egyptian economy. And their life is still closer to his age than to ours. For thousands of years, they have depended on the Nile flood to raise their one or perhaps two crops a year. When the flood was low, the sun dried the soil to dust. When it was high, the crops were drowned. Disease and poverty made their lives laborious and short. The death rate of children is still five or six times that of Britain. Out of the 30 million population of Egypt, 20 million manage to live off the land. The remaining 10 million crowd into the towns, their numbers swollen by the unemployed from the country. To the poor peasant, Cairo seems a legendary city whose streets must be paved with piastres. But here too, the struggle for existence is bitter. Three or four pounds a week is a good wage for a working man, and many exist on less than that. This is a world where time and labour are cheap, where everything is reckoned to be the will of God, and there is little a man can do to change it. One thing is certainly inevitable, and that is the remorseless arithmetic of population. In the narrow strip of the Nile Valley and in the cities, there are more people per square mile than anywhere else on Earth. And the population is increasing by three quarters of a million a year. Faced with these frightening figures, Egypt has been forced back once again on its basic source of wealth, the Nile. The Aswan High Dam is Egypt's greatest hope for the future. It's expected to double the crops of the Nile Valley, generate enough electricity to supply three cities the size of Birmingham, and help to double the national income. It's the largest rock-filled dam in the world, two miles long, 350 feet high, and equal in volume to 17 great pyramids.
Already it's holding back the largest man-made lake in the world, six miles wide and 300 miles long. The Nile Valley need never be parched or drowned again. The rising waters of the lake threaten to submerge one of the oldest historical monuments in the world, the temples of Abu Simbel, carved out of the hillside 32 centuries ago. By a rescue operation as fantastic as the temples themselves, they were sliced into sections and rebuilt 200 feet above the original site. Twice a year, the rays of the rising sun still strike through the doorway into the depths of the inner sanctuary. The temples of Ramses II and his queen have been saved from drowning, but there was no way of saving the villages of the people who lived here. They now lie beneath the lake, while the villages were removed to a desert area below the dam and the waters of the Nile were brought to them. Government aid and self-help are reclaiming the desert, which is now growing crops for the first time in history. The new villages, with piped water and electricity, are a vast improvement on the old. Not long ago, this child might have died for lack of skilled surgery. Today, a hospital is part of the community. For older people, the upheaval has been shattering. But the younger generation is taking it for granted. The 15,000 men working on the dam have also had a revolution in their lives. Before work began in 1960, they were peasants and labourers, and all of them had to be trained from scratch. The government refused to allow skilled labour to be moved from other projects. For most of the men, it was the first time they had earned a regular living wage. After years of this kind of job, they can never go back to the old way of life. Across the harsh deserts, the power of the dam is carried to the new factories and to the cities of Alexandria and Cairo. It brings the promise of steady employment and a rising standard of living for the first time in Egypt's history. Egypt still has a long way to go, but a start has been made. The power from the Aswan High Dam is changing not only the economy, but the way men think. And of all the genies that were ever let out of bottles in the East, this could be one of the most powerful. Thank you.